Dr. Merkison, who is going to be talking about surgery. Uh, she's on the Oculoplastic and Orbital Surgery Service at Wills and is also the director of our exceedingly busy and fascinating emergency room. Uh, so uh, she'll probably have to shuttle back and forth a few times today. Um, but uh, if, if there is anyone, any Cowboys fan that doesn't follow my instructions later today, you will probably be seeing Dr. Merkison later this afternoon or tomorrow morning. So we're going to be talking primarily about the surgical management of blepharospasm. I'll talk, touch briefly on the management um, for hemifacial spasm. I have no disclosures. Um, so some of this you're already aware of, but as an overview of what we'll talk about, anatomy, I'll touch on that briefly. You're already aware of that, and some of that has been reviewed. Some of the related clinical problems that we see. And of, and of course, the surgical options. Is that better? Can you hear me? OK. Yell out again if you can't. <laughs> and the results and risks that we see with these surgeries. So again, a review of basic eyelid anatomy. Um, we think of the, the muscles in the eyelids as antagonistic muscles, the muscles that open and the muscles that close. The main closer is really the orbicularis oculi muscle with the main opener being the levator muscle. So what do I mean by that? Well, the orbicularis is actually a ring of muscles, and this is concentric rings starting at the edge of the eyelid with the pretarsal orbicularis, and then outside of that ring, a larger ring, the preceptal orbicularis, and outside of that, the orbital orbicularis, and that's the one overlying the bone. So, the pretarsal and preceptal orbicularis actually are your blink muscles primarily, whereas the orbital orbicularis acts more with the wink, the more forceful closure, has a larger role for that. So what do those do in appearance? So here you see a patient looking straight ahead and then with forceful closure. So again, that's primarily the orbit, orbital orbicularis that's functioning here with this forceful closure or you can see that with a wink. As I mentioned, there are other closers as well that play a smaller role. Those include the corrugator muscle here in green and the procerus muscle here. So again, how do we see those act? Here you see the patient almost a scowl. You do get a little bit of closure with activation of these muscles, though not full closure. What about the openers? So I mentioned the levator being the main opener. So you can see here extending from the tarsus, this is underneath the orbicularis, extending superiorly, being the main opener of the lid. And this muscle, you can imagine, it's working against that orbicularis. So these are antagonistic muscles. So when you're having forceful closure, especially if you're trying to open, this muscle is getting stretched. So these muscles are fighting each other and stretching each other out. But how do we see this levator work? So here you see the patient looking down, and then on activating the levator, again, the main opener lifts the lid. As I mentioned, there are other openers. They play a smaller role. Um, this includes the frontalis, or the eyebrow muscle, and Mueller's muscle. So the frontalis, you can see here, extends basically above the orbital orbicularis superiorly. And the Mueller's muscle is a smaller muscle, which was mentioned earlier, um, and that underlies the levator muscle and plays a smaller role in opening the lid. So here again, we see a patient looking straight ahead, and then an activation of that frontalis muscle not only lifts the brow, but has a small role in actually lifting the lid as well. And here's another patient, and this is just to demonstrate what happens when Mueller's muscle doesn't work. So on the patient's right side, it's a little bit lower, so Mueller's is not working. The other side, Mueller's works, and you can see that does provide a small amount of lift of that lid. Not as much as your levator, but it is one of the, the openers of the lid. So you can see that this is a very complex interplay between these antagonistic muscles. And here we see the cross-section of that. And this is going to be important as we start talking about surgical options. 
So if we start from the skin level, working our way back, you have the muscle. Again, in cross-section here, this is in sort of the purple area, and you can see once the skin is removed, that orbicularis and the frontalis. And then as we move deeper, here you can see the septum. This is in green on our cross-section. And then once we get through the fat underlying that septum, you can see here, this is our levator, again outlined in purple, extending up into the fornix and into the orbit. And then the structural support of our lid, the tarsus, here in green in cross-section. So you can see how that becomes very complex with these muscles working against each other in all of these structures. And then, of course, you have the nerve, the facial nerve, controlling these muscles. Of course, damage in that facial nerve is going to result in weakness and can include paresis of one whole side of the face, such as you see with the Bell's palsy. And you can see how complex that is here with the nerve coming out and woven in between all the layers of the face. And if we simplify that here, you can see the root of the nerve right near the ear and then extending, really arborizing like a tree, branching out along the side of the face. The two branches that we care the most about in blepharospasm would be these two branches, the zygomatic and the buccal branch, because this is what's going to innervate those muscles that are providing forceful closure of the lids. So the main surgery that you're probably all aware of is a myectomy. And we, we talk about it as if it's one surgery, but there really are a lot of gradations within myectomies. So in general, this is a removal of the orbicularis through a skin incision. Many people talk about this as the Anderson procedure. So this is really removal of the entire orbicularis. So think about how much muscle that is, all those rings, as well as the corrugator and the procerus, really trying to remove all of those closers of the lid. You can have a more limited myectomy where you're just removing a portion of orbicularis. Now, sometimes we see patients who've had basically a blepharoplasty and think they say they've had a myectomy. Well, a blepharoplasty, which we'll touch on in a minute, really is not even a limited myectomy. That just removes a tiny little strip of orbicularis to remove some extra skin on the lid, which is not the same as the more um, involved removal of muscle that we see even in a limited myectomy. So in an Anderson procedure, you generally have multiple skin incisions. These are the common incisions you see here at the base of the eyebrow, as well as in the fold of the upper lid, and then right underneath the lashes of the lower lid. And then this, again, is going back to what muscles we need to remove. So those incisions allow you to access all of these closers of the lid. Removing all of that muscle would be a full myectomy. A limited myectomy can allow you to make fewer skin incisions to access some of the muscle. Um, in general, this is a staged procedure. So if you make that upper lid incision, you can access this upper anatomy, removing the closers here. One of the, the positives that can come from this is when we talked about that arborization of the nerves into this area of the face, out at this outside corner, you can actually damage those nerves, which can functionally be quite helpful, including decreasing some of the innervation or the signal that goes to the lower lid. Just with that upper lid myectomy, you can have some improvement to the lower lid as well. And then again, if needed, usually on a staged basis, you can do a lower lid myectomy with that same incision underneath the lashes but this time removing the orbicularis underneath the eye. There's also facial nerve surgery. So a full neurectomy, this is very rarely done now, um, but this would sever the facial nerve trunk. Um, and this would, as we mentioned earlier, of course, cause a facial paralysis on that side. So yes, it would eliminate the signal causing the spasms, but it would result in a facial palsy. 
There's also limited norectomy. So that can be done with, um, with Botox, and this can result in denervation of the muscle um, by affecting the facial nerve. And usually, again, this would be concentrated on the branches that we mentioned, the zygomatic and buccal branches that are affecting a forceful closure. So here, if you incised this root, of course, that would impact all of those branches um, as a surgical procedure versus just affecting chemically the branches that are affecting the forceful closure of the lids. Now, just briefly, for hemifacial spasm, there is surgery for that as well. Um, the common surgery would be the microvascular decompression. Um, it's sometimes called the Janetta procedure, named for the physician who, who first described this procedure. Um, this is a larger procedure. This requires general anesthesia, usually uh, about a three-day admission to the hospital. Um, and an incision is made, you can see here on this diagram, behind the ear and an opening in the skull about a centimeter in size um, to access the facial nerve and to remove the, um, the rubbing between the artery and the nerve by basically pasting a cushion in between. Um, here they show it as a sponge. It can, uh, there are other things that can be used like Teflon, but you basically want to put a little barrier, a little cushion in between those. Um, Many patients do not have an immediate improvement with that, so it can take some time for them to see a good result from that. But overall, the long-term outcome is good for about 85% of the patients. Um, approximately 2% per year may have a recurrence, however. Um, and of course, it has risks. And as you can imagine, one of the main ones uh, would be affecting the nerve itself. Um, and it can also affect the hearing. So what kind of secondary problems um, can we also see with the, the spasms and, and what we can do about that? Well, some of the common problems would be brow ptosis, where the eyebrows or the forehead get droopy. And again, a lot of these problems that we talk about are because of those antagonistic nature of the muscles. The openers and the closers are constantly fighting each other and stretching things out. Dermaticolasis, so that's the overhanging skin of the upper lid. Ptosis, again, that stretched out muscle of the opener of the lid um, can cause the lid itself to be droopy. So here if we see a diagram of just normal brow height, and then again, the eyelid itself is in good position, but the eyebrow becomes droopy, and that can cause some weight on the upper lid. And that's from that stretching of the frontalis from that constant battle. So here you can see a clinical photo. The eyebrows are low causing the upper lid skin to not be stretched out and way down on the eye. Here you can see dermaticolasis, so that's just the skin of the upper lid. And if you see in the cross section here, all of this skin that's gotten stretched out should be up here, but now it's weighing down over the eyelashes. Whereas ptosis, again, that stretching out of the levator lifting muscle, causes the lid itself where the lashes are to be low. So when you look in cross-section, you can see here how much longer that levator is. Here it's much shorter, so it's gotten stretched out, allowing that lid to droop down. So here's a clinical photo of that dermaticolasis, all that skin weighing down. The dotted line is where the lid margin actually is, versus ptosis, where that muscle that lifts the lid, the levator's stretched out, causing the entire lid to droop down. So we can do surgery to help fix and address these problems. For dermaticolasis, that would be a blepharoplasty, removing some of that weighty skin um, and a little bit of the fat or muscle, whereas ptosis, again, would be shortening or tightening that muscle, that levator muscle that's gotten stretched out. Um, ptosis is a little bit more challenging, and I think all of us with oculoplastics, it's something that we've never found a way to perfect it in, in anyone's careers. We all look to our mentors and have the same problems. But um, for many people, it can provide a, a good result and improved vision, but may require some readjustments. The downside with any of these surgeries, you can imagine, is 
anything that's going to make the eye more open, whether it's allowing the excess skin to not weigh things down or lifting the muscle to make the eyes more open, can also make them more dry. So you may have had experiences where your eye feels dry or irritated, um, especially after Botox. Imagine that persisting. Um, so that's something we have to be careful about, and it can even induce lag ophthalmos where the eye won't close, leading to more long-term exposure and irritation problems of the lid, and sometimes even exacerbating the, the eye's need to, to blink and leading to sort of a, um, an irritant causing functional blepharospasm from that. But a blepharoplasty in general, we make an incision in the outside of the lid using the lid crease, removing some of that excess skin and a small strip, again, not a myectomy, but a small strip of the underlying muscle, opening the orbital septum, either removing or sculpting a bit of that fat, and then suturing closed. Whereas a levator resection for ptosis surgery, when that entire lid is droopy, is a little bit more involved, the same initial incision through the lid crease and then dissecting down to the levator and reattaching that, shortening it so that it's not so stretched out, attach it to the tarsus, and again, trying to adjust the lids to try to get them to match each other and not have too much exposure of the eye itself or lag ophthalmos. Other things, the brow ptosis we mentioned, um, there are multiple ways that this can be repaired really depends on the patient um, and the, the type of surgery and setting that the, the surgeon works in. So again, here's our patient with the brow ptosis. Here are several different incisions that can be used. It can range from a, what we call a direct brow lift, from almost like a blepharoplasty, but this time of the brow, removing some tissue there in A, or an incision up in, if a patient does have folds in their forehead, using an incision there, at the hairline, or even behind the hairline. I think more commonly these days, though, um, often patients will have an endoscopic brow lift. So the upside with this is these are very small incisions, um, usually a centimeter or so, that can be hidden back in the hairline. Um, it does take a little bit more equipment, um, and the expertise of someone who has been doing endoscopic surgery, but can lead to a really nice result. Um, so that is a, a newer option that's available. And it lifts all of this tissue up. Of course, there's risks with any surgery. Um, we touched on a few of those. And unfortunately, the risk can happen to anyone. With a myectomy, the biggest thing, and I mentioned this before, would be lag ophthalmos. This is almost 20%, so that's almost one in five patients. So again, that can lead to a lot of irritation of the eye, has the potential for dryness or infections, and when the eye is irritated, that can make it want to blink or spasm more. So that's a balance that, that you and your doctor are constantly trying to, to find of how much open can you get without too much exposure or dryness. You can also get bleeding, which can result in a hematoma, skin necrosis, ectropion, decreased sensation or hypesthesia in the forehead area, um, and a lot of swelling or lymphedema. So these are not patients who had myectomies, but this sort of gives you an idea of what, what we're talking about. So a hematoma or bleeding in a severe case like this, this could even lead to an orbital hemorrhage. That can lead to vision loss. Um, so we talk about bleeding. Most of the time, thankfully, that's, that's fairly minimal. But it is something that has to be done carefully. And if it's not caught early in a patient like this, again, can lead to permanent vision loss. Skin necrosis. Again, it wouldn't be on the forehead in this case. You'd be talking about the eyelid skin but you've removed that underlying vascular bed of the muscle, sometimes the overlying skin can basically die. Ectropion. So here you can see on this patient's right eye how that lower lid is hanging out. So when the muscle's removed, you don't have the tone, um, and the whole lid can become unstable, and that lower lid can be floppy. Usually will flop out, but also could flop in. Um, 
if you had to pick one out is better. So that certainly can happen. And as I mentioned before, lag ophthalma. So you can see here that eye doesn't close and can lead to even worse irritation and dryness and the things we mentioned before. And that dryness can lead to a lot of exposure. So you can see here this eye is very open. That would obviously make it more dry. Um, and when it can't close all the way, as in the other photo, again, this can lead to infections and is that, that constant balance that's so hard to find. With ptosis surgery, as I mentioned, one of the things that we are concerned about would be asymmetry. So the lid height or the curve, the contour of the upper lid may be different between the eyes, um, and that can require some readjustment. Infection with these surgeries, always a possibility. Um, often it can just be treated uh, on an outpatient basis, but a severe infection like this can extend deeper or could require IV antibiotics. And hypesthesia. As you know, because we talked about a lot of this branching nature of the nerves, one of the branches you can see here extending up onto the forehead. So surgery can damage that and lead to a decrease in sensation that does not always return to normal. Lymphedema. So this is just of the upper lids. So when you're removing all of those muscles with a myectomy, you're also removing some of the lymphatic system. So if there's no good drainage, then all of that swelling can persist. And you can imagine if you'd had a full myectomy of the upper and lower lids, this amount of swelling of the upper and lower lids would be pretty unappealing um, and can lead to a lot of irritation as well. So after a myectomy, the recurrence of the spasms occurred in about 50% of patients at five years. Um, very often, this was in the lower lid. The good part is many of those patients had their spasms controlled with continued Botox, usually a lower dose than they had before. Um, unfortunately, the injections may become more painful at that point. So you can imagine we've removed so much tissue and now there's scar tissue there, so you're injecting just under skin into scar. So while the dose may be lower, the discomfort may be a little higher. The good part is um, the majority of these patients, over 90%, said that the myectomy did provide them significant benefits. Um, and I think part of that may be who has the myectomy. The patients who generally make it to that surgical point have tried pretty much everything else and are more severe um, spasms despite all of their medical treatments. Um, so they certainly may find more benefit with it. A limited myectomy may provide more long-term relief, certainly, than a facial nerve avulsion, particularly with the, the side effects of that. So in summary, I think a limited myectomy is usually reserved for patients with severe blepharospasm who failed Botox or other sorts of um, medical therapies. And the surgery may have to be staged. Still may need injections afterwards, as I mentioned. Um, and unfortunately, those may be more painful, but they may be at a lower dose. And remember, all of these surgeries, unfortunately, have risks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I think that the, the one slide up there, and, and again, it depends where you, where you live and what physicians practice in your area. But when it comes to myectomy, my goal is to talk patients out of it. Um, and I do myectomies, but by the time the patient actually agrees to go ahead with a myectomy with me, as Dr. Merkison said, we've kind of done a natural selection where the patient has severe uh, blepharospasm that is just refractory to therapy. We've tried everything else. They understand the risks. They're willing to take those risks. And I think that's why you end up with a high success rate, because you, you've selected that patient that understands what's going on. I, I basically refuse to do myectomies in someone who 
is doing okay on Botox and just doesn't want to use Botox anymore. That to me is not enough of a reason to, to undertake the risks of myectomy. Okay, so I, I think that, that was an important point uh, she made.